All right. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. It's great to be here today talking with all of you. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is the GDELT project. So this is really the vision of the GDELT project, which is this idea of scooping up the world's information um, and trying to create essentially a real-time catalog of planet Earth. Um, specifically focus on news material. So looking at news, whether that's uh, online news, print media, spoken word media, such as radio and of course, uh, imagery, and of course today, video. Um, so really the idea of, of GDL is essentially scooping up all this information across the world, looking specifically across languages um, to really be able to reach the local narratives across our world. Um, and to be able to use this material, to analyze all this material by machine, to do things like analyze, for example, the map world events in real time, to be able to reach uh, across those events, to actually look at the narratives. So how is something being described? We all know about, say, the wildfires here in the US. How are those being contextualized around the world? And then the emotions that are expressed in media. So all journalism, of course, includes a degree of emotional attachment to that. So how is that expressed uh, within it? And GDL itself is an enormous data set. It, it, it encompasses, um, oh God, I forgot how many tens of trillions of data points these days. Um, and it's incorporated a huge number of data sets. But today we're going to focus primarily on the on the visual uh, dimension of this. And I should add, um, GDL makes full, um, GDL is based in, in Google's cloud. So it's using all of these different tools, especially, of course, in the visual realm, um, things like vision API and video API, and then text or speech to text API for transcription. Um, but it also makes use of all these other tools like BigQuery and inference API and these other tools to make sense of all that data. Um, so I'm going to start with still imagery, since this is kind of the, the more simplistic side of video uh, for us, um, and something called the Visual Global Knowledge Graph. Uh, so since 2016, uh, we've analyzed uh, roughly uh, about two, uh, since 2016, uh, we've analyzed uh, about, about half a billion or so uh, images, calling about a quarter of a trillion pixels. So every 15 minutes, we basically take a sample of all the imagery appearing in the news media, online media around the world, and we analyze that through cloud vision. So this looks at, say, the objects and activities. It OCRs it on about, I think, 300 languages now. It tries to estimate the geography of this image. We look at facial emotion. We extract out ex 5 metadata. Um, we perform also reverse image search. So we actually search the web to see where else has this image appeared across the web, what are some of the places it appeared, and how has it been captioned across the web? So here's this image that purports, for example, to be a breaking protest right now um, in Iran. We can say, well, actually, this image has been around for about 10 years. Uh, it uh, contains, uh, it contains uh, Saudi Arabic. Um, and traditionally, most of the, most of the um, um, captions of this uh, around the world have captioned it as Saudi Arabia. So we can do some really interesting work that has a lot of, for example, references to misinformation. We can look at, for example, for climate change, is it being represented as polar bears and deserts? And you can actually see that transition occurring. Um, we can look at, um, for example, the percentage of violent imagery. Um, so we can look at some really, really interesting uh, things in terms of, uh, for example, um, this is actually an interesting one because this gets at, so we're looking at all the imagery, news imagery out of each country. How often is that tagged by Google's algorithms as potentially containing violence? What this is getting at is not really the violence of imagery, um, but it's getting at that in a lot of countries, imagery is very sanitized. So here in the U.S., we've seen precisely one um, deceased refugee, and that was Alan Curdy, the 10-year-old boy uh, that drowned. Otherwise, to Americans, they're hearing about the refugee crisis in Europe, primarily through statistics, you know, saying that, you know, X tens of thousands of people have crossed in the last X amount of time. We don't really see um, that. And this is a very powerful thing in terms of emotional distancing and, and you know, how we understand things. Looking at imagery with human face. So is, you know, the news conveyed through humans or is it conveyed through objects and activities? We can try to look in the facial emotions and try to map this out. We can do really interesting things like find me all the imagery that was captioned as Donald Trump. So it does not do facial recognition. Um, we can do this really interesting. If you look on the right there, um, you'll see China versus the Philippines, uh, Trump versus the Pope. At the time period, uh, China was uh, was unhappy with Trump. So you saw this you know, kind of haggard look, the Pope you know, kind of excited, and vice versa in the Philippines, which is the opposite. And it's very really powerful as we can start kind of looking across the visual narratives. This is something we've never been able to do before. You know, most of our data is really focused on text versus the first time we can really look at the, emo the visual narratives of the news. We can look at things like real-time um, mapping, for example, of floods and natural disasters. We can measure, for example, pollution by looking at the background of all these images. We can geolocate them, put them on a map. 
um, we can do really interesting things like visual clustering. So we can take, for example, all those images and all the labels and things that are found in those images, and then actually see how often these things cluster together. So we can look at kind of related visual narratives. Now, some of this, of course, is inferring from the underlying models, um, but a lot of this, it's actually very interesting as you break this down by country um, and by topic, we can see really fascinating uh, correlations in terms of how things are grouped together. Um, but of course, the focus today is on video. Um, and I want to focus on, I want to kind of preview with still imagery because it's, it really shows the power. And that's actually where we started in 2016. Um, but for video, it's incredible the different types of things that we can do. I mean, video obviously today um, still incorporates, still encompasses really this, um, you know, even in the era of web streaming, um, of course, again, that's another form of video. Uh, but for us, it's, you know, television news is so powerful. It, it, it forms such a powerful way um, through which people see the news around them. Um, so one of the very first ways that we've accessed video, and we've done this for a number of years in collaboration with the Internet Archive. So this is actually a collaboration with the Internet Archive's television news archive. And for a number of years, we've looked at closed captioning. So we essentially allow you to keyword search closed captioning and see, for example, um, how often is a particular topic being mentioned. So what you're seeing here, for example, this is the percentage of airtime that mentioned uh, words relating to the Beirut explosion. Um, and you can actually see, for example, BBC News, Al Jazeera were among the first to really cover it. Here in the US, it just did not get much airtime. It just was not of interest. Um, and this is a really powerful way. This is actually BBC News London. Um, so this is a really powerful way. And then, of course, seeing how quickly it faded um, it faded from discussion. So closed captioning search, while again, it's, it's not, it's, you're missing that visual dimension, we can still treat the spoken word as essentially textual narrative. It's more complicated for machines to understand, obviously, because you have stream of consciousness, you have, of course, uh, you know, all the ums and uhs and other complications. Although, thankfully, actually, ASR, um, things like Google's ASR, actually extract out and remove those, uh, those utterances. But again, this ability, closed captioning, we can still do a tremendous amount just just with closed captioning. And I should add, uh, because obviously, you know, here in the US, television stations are required to be closed captioned. Across the world, that's not necessarily the case in all countries. So obviously, in other countries, we have to rely on automatic speech recognition. Now, historically, ASR was, you know, it was not well looked upon because the accuracy was, wasn't great, to put it mildly. So we've actually been doing a lot of interesting studies here in the US, looking at CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, looking at uh, 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 local media, so ABC, CBS, NBC affiliates, PBS, looking at this, this whole range of material. And what's really interesting about this is we've actually been comparing the human closed captioning against the ASR. So we, we run each of these broadcasts through Google's text-to-speech. And we're actually finding it's more accurate, at least as accurate, and in many cases, more accurate than the human transcriptioning. Now, again, there's a difference between uh, you know, multi-coder transcriptioning, where you have multiple people typing up a closed caption, you have multiple people reviewing that. So the type of things you do, say, in the motion picture industry. In television, obviously, most of this is real-time. Here in the U.S., a lot of it's, it's actually primarily uh, contractors sitting at home typing away. And this is actually really interesting because um, here, what you actually find is that a lot of the time they miss the honorifics and the titles. So, for example, when introducing the, ambas the U.S. ambassador to Estonia, uh, what you'll find, for example, on American television news, it'll just say, here's so-and-so. And they won't type off, as they say, the U.S. ambassador to Estonia and blankety blank blank. The human won't type any of that. They'll actually pause at that point versus, of course, the machine ASR captures all that. Uh, it supports today about 125 languages and variants. Um, and what we're finding, actually, is that this is, is that ASR is actually coming to the point where we can actually use it in place of the human capturing, actually get a more accurate read. Uh, so this is actually a very interesting kind of fundamental moment in terms of, now again, that's not necessarily the case for all languages, but certainly for English, where we've been really evaluating it heavily, um, we're finding it actually exceeds what we're getting out of the, the human captioning. Um, so what can we do with this? So obviously one key area we do a lot of work in uh, is, um, so we obviously you can do keyword search, but we also have something called the global entity graph. So we take all that closed captioning and we analyze it using natural language, uh, using Google's natural language API. So we extract out all the entities that are referenced. We perform things like dependency parsing. So we actually start building these very complex graphs of what's being discussed in the news media. What's interesting about this is the entity, rev entity resolution includes co-ref. So for example, there's a famous exchange we looked at. There were two US senators debating on, I think it was CNN, and they're addressing each other as, Senator, I want 
want to say this. Senator, I want to say this. And it actually was able to follow. Again, it's, it's not doing, um, you know, there, there's no speaker identification there. It's purely using the closed captioning, which did not include which senator was speaking at which moment, but was able to piece that together based on the flow of the dialogue. Uh, so again, this very powerful way of, uh, of essentially being able to to use, rely again entirely on the closed captioning to do this really powerful annotation work. We've also been doing a lot of work on dividing broadcasts into stories because obviously broadcast news is essentially a one long, continuous 24 hour stream of, of essentially stream of consciousness speaking. Um, now, again, that is broken up by shows, so you have personality-driven shows, et cetera, but especially news programming um, is one continuous line of shows. So how do you divide this into actually stories? So take an evening news broadcast here, half an hour, uh, it might cover 10 different stories. We want a segment to that. We can't look at camera changes because camera changes are, are at least in today's modern television news, a single story um, will include multiple camera changes back from the studio to the field and different field from the reporter to the person being interviewed. It's a very complicated, um, you know, rapid fire, rapid paced environment. So visual, visual um, annotations don't do us, don't allow us to really segment by story. So you're actually doing a lot of work on semantic similarity. So this is actually using these, these very large language models, things like BERT, sort of the equivalent, not, not BERT obviously, but this, this kind of this large world of um, these AI models to actually actually goes to the closed captioning. So it takes a line and it sees, does this line, is this line entailed by the line that uh, ahead of it? So in other words, does, if I say this line and then I say this line, does that suggest that I'm within the same story or I'm splitting to a new story? So we actually compute this line by line through the closed captioning. We can actually generate these essentially dendrogram trees that basically give us both the macro level stories, but then the thematic stories. And you can actually cross those and ask, for example, take COVID-19 around the world. We can say this whole broadcast is COVID, but here are all these sub stories that come into this. Um, but of course, television, the most powerful part of television is the visual narratives there. Um, so this is the visual global entity graph. So in collaboration with the Television News Archive, we're non-consumptively visually analyzing um, television news. So we have a whole bunch of different broadcasts that we're doing here, and actually a, a very large uh, program I'll come back to in a minute, looking at how COVID-19 and other diseases um, are actually um, uh, being uh, covered in television news. So essentially we have Google's Cloud Video watch 24 hours these broadcasts, 24 hours a day, they're watching all these broadcasts, and this describing second by second what they see in that coverage. Um, and we actually make the JSON annotation of this available. You can analyze it. We have a real-time search engine, so you can actually visually search, uh, and I'll come back to some of the things you can do with that. Um, now, one of the challenges, of course, is that machine visual ascension. So when machines analyze all this video, they're doing so at the level of an individual frame. So this is complicated because humans don't think in terms of frames. We think in terms of seconds of airtime. And this is actually how all the human content analysis world goes. So this is actually a simple example. This is actually a commercial for a, a, a movie. Um, there are five different stories presented in a single second of airtime. This is actually something we're doing a lot of work on right now, is trying to understand how do you kind of merge, how do you blend the frame level precision of machine annotations with the human second level precision, because you know when we if we summarize this to a one second airtime, which is how humans oftentimes they think about seconds of airtime, not frames of video. Um, when we think of seconds of airtime, these all, all five of these stories, for example, blend together, and that makes it a little bit confusing in terms of thinking about um, analytic um, sort of analytic resolution. So there's a lot of fascinating things when you use when you use AI instead of human annotation. Um, we've actually been doing some interesting work. Um, actually, there was an interesting, uh, Lauren Picard actually did this very interesting one looking at shot changes. So you take camera changes um, within a broadcast, and you take the first frame of each of those camera changes, and you can generate these very interesting kind of uh, very rapid fire visual summaries of sort of the visual narratives uh, of a broadcast. We have, of course, the television AI Explorer. So here, you can actually thematic visually search news. So you can say, find me broadcast with a podium or uh, find me broadcast with bookcases. So we, we did some fascinating graphs showing how uh, during the COVID pandemic, everyone's shooting from home. So the bookcases on television is skyrocketing. We can show how CNN began relying uh, heavily on, on Cisco's WebEx for its work. Um, OCR, this is really fascinating actually, because you can see the upper left here, this was an ABC News broadcast, um, with, I, think this, I think this was actually Urdu, um, and again, just transcribing it perfectly, multilingual OCR from the broadcast in real time, you know, in the lower left there, kind of a worst case scenario of OCR, recovers it perfectly, lower right there, of course, that was the Deepwell Horizon, machine generated text again, flawless OCR. 
Um, motion OCR, again, this is a really powerful thing. Um, you know, when we, when we used to do video analysis, we'd break it in the frames, um, you know, one second frames. And of course, you know, here that, cap, that Chiron at the bottom, no more, that word's actually cars. Um, but again, because it's using motion OCR, you have that, that full recovery. We can do very interesting things so we can trace text on the OCR. So we can actually look at, by looking for the source credit line on CNN's COVID dashboard, we can actually tell you, um, actually measure the airtime that the COVID dashboard's occurring. We can actually look at all Trump's tweets that are showing up on television news. Um, we can look for doctors. So this is a case where we look for all references to doctor. So anytime a, someone's being interviewed on television, the, um, the title of them, if it says doctor, we grab their name, we actually make a histogram over time. So we can actually look at who's telling the COVID-19 story. We can look at visual anatomy, so entities per second, OCR amount of text, visual similarity. So this is actually using all the entities extracted from each second of airtime. And we'd actually compare, in this case, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. So we actually see where they break apart, where they come back together again. We can actually show for example, or sorry, this is ABC, NBC, CBS. We can actually show um, visual alignment when they're covering the same story, when they're covering different stories, when they're covering the same story through very different lenses. Um, so we can actually look at how visually similar those narratives are. This is actually a really interesting one. This was a CNN broadcast with this clip, COVID-19 clip, no details, just this, this video of someone sitting in a hospital bed um, with no information. So we took a screen capture of that, and then we ran that um, through Cloud Vision, which does a reverse image search across the open web. And from that, immediately the output of that is, it tells us this is Durban, Dagestan, it was likely sourced from Moscow 24, um, and we get captions um, for how the images have been captured across the web. Nurses in Durban, we trade in a back room. So essentially we've gone from this clip on CNN, it just says COVID-19 is spreading across the world. No detail about that clip. And by taking that frame, uh, reverse image search, again, it's completely automatic, no human in the loop, we're able to now fully understand what this clip is, where it came from, and then actually we, you know, um, from that we, we, we space out and we actually then get a complete rich description of this. So again, that ability to use the web to contextualize television. Sorry um, to interrupt, Kalev, uh, we, we only have one minute left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I have four more minutes, thank you. Um, so here's the, you know, so here's a, another example of an, of an interesting broadcast. So this was actually a CNN broadcast um, uh, this is actually interesting because here in the U.S., uh, we do not actually allow people, for example, to go into tele uh, to take television um, cameras into hospitals. Um, I, obviously, a lot of the imagery comes from Europe, where apparently that is allowed. Um, it's not here in the U.S. And so one of the challenges is where do television networks get their coverage from? So what we did is we handed it um, one of CNN's COVID broadcasts, and we did exactly this. We took every one second of video and then searched the open web to see is this actually something that CNN filmed itself or not? So this is actually very interesting. This was actually a portion of CNN um, where they're talking about one of the vaccines and how this vaccine discovery is happening. It turns out the coverage was actually not the vaccine. Um, this was actually an uh, iStock photo. This is actually a Getty imagery. Um, so again, this very powerful piece, and, and we're also able to show um, by crawling the web, pulling this imagery from the web, and connecting the AX5 metadata, we're actually able to then tell you, describe, essentially describe and contextualize this broadcast. And finally, in collaboration with the MDRC, um, they ha uh, we're actually doing a very, very interesting analysis. So we've monitored um, all of this year, and then uh, we're actually looking at major disease outbreaks over the last uh, 10 years, and actually understanding the visual narratives of all that, allowing us to understand how is the COVID-19 story being told in comparison, for example, to these past outbreaks, and what are all the different differences in that visual narrative, and what can we learn from that? Um, so thank you very much. I know I've covered a lot of ground really fast, and I know I have exactly two minutes for Q&A. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'd like to open it up. Okay, thank you very much, Caleb. Yes, indeed, very intense. I mean, it's just a, a great reflection of what's possible when this effort is made to collect so much useful uh, data. Uh, while we get to the questions, I mean, I also have some questions that I'm sure others are thinking. I mean, the first one would be where the, the, this project gets its funding from, because I'm, I'm sure you're generating with all these Google APIs, I'm sure you're generating a lot of costs. And another key one would be in terms of the, the data that you have, how open it is, and, and yes. if it's usable for, for commercial purposes. Thank you. Yes, so um, all of our data is open data. Um, all of our annotations are, are open. Um, you know, we have support from a number of things. So actually, um, uh, Alphabet Jigsaw has supported Google for many years. Um, we actually, um, you know, one of our big sources, we actually provided one of the very first external alerts to COVID-19 um, was actually an organization in Canada, Blue Dot Global, that actually mined our data and actually sent out one of the very first external alerts on December 31st. 
Um, so we're actually used, um, you know, we're used, being right, used right now to understand, for example, you know, you know, all these different things across the world. Um, so our data really, you know, television is, is one piece of it. And right now, um, so MDRC, which is one of our collaborators with the Internet Archive, um, they've actually received uh, actually a large grant uh, from Google's COVID research to actually understand the visual narratives of COVID. How is that story being told? And what can we learn and understand from that uh, in terms of, you know, why is it that there's resistance to COVID? Um, whereas, for example, with Zika and Ebola, and these other outbreaks, you didn't see this widespread public resistance. And part of that, um, we believe, is how that story is being told, especially on um, television news, for example. So we're doing a lot of this interesting work in terms of how are these stories being told? What can we understand from those visual narratives? And yes, all of the data. Um, so yes, so this is all, um, all the non-consumptive annotations are available. So you can download this rich visual, uh, these rich, rich visual annotations. Um, and actually, we the television explorer is widely used in the journalism world to actually um, catalog uh, how television Television news um, is covering different uh, topics around the world. Um, and in terms of one of the Q&A questions, uh, you know, are we using outside uh, knowledge sources? So in our particular case, we're annotating this, um, and you can do, you know, you can then do your own kind of enrichments around that. So, uh, for example, if you, you know, we'll just extract, for example, that, you know, Donald Trump was mentioned here, um, but you can do your own types of analyses in terms of, well, what is, you know, who is Donald Trump? What does that mean? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, uh, so the, the short answer, I know I've covered a huge amount of ground here, uh, but the short answer is this is a massive open data project. You know, we've had past support from the National Academies, the World Bank, a lot of different organizations to try to really catalog and create sort of an open data catalog of the world so we can really see the world through others' eyes. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Kalev. And I mean, I really hope that we hear more about others using this data. I mean, you're obviously internally also doing lots of fascinating analyses with this, but given that it's open, uh, really hopeful that uh, we find others also exploring the data set and maybe finding other uses uh, for it. And, and uh, yeah, I'm and sure you'll be hanging around. So just mm -hmm. go to gdeltproject.org and all the data is there. Super. Thank you so much.